All right, good morning everyone. Uh, again, this is uh, a third lecture in this series. And uh, my name is Anant Agarwal and my colleague, uh, Dr. Arash Salami has helped me prepare this lecture. So last time we had talked about intrinsic semiconductors, we had talked about doping the semiconductor with n-type or p-type to increase the number of electrons in the conduction band or number of free holes in the valence band. And we had uh, talked about equations that describe the number of uh, electrons in the conduction band and the number of holes in the valence band and we had uh, decided that n times p is always equals to n i square, whether it is an intrinsic material or n type or p type material. So, to go over this slide again, which we had covered last time, uh, we have uh, on the left hand side n type silicon where we have impurity atoms, uh, in this case let us say phosphorus atoms, slightly below the conduction band edge and at room temperature they give up the electrons to the conduction band and now as a result they are positively charged, but we have lot of electrons in the conduction band. In addition, we have thermal electrons which represent N i, which we had talked about earlier. Then the total number of electrons will now be roughly equal to the total number of electrons coming from impurity atoms and then the number of holes would be sim governed by the equation below, which is n p equals to n i squared. Same thing on the right hand side with p type silicon, we have doped this silicon with lot of acceptor atoms uh, uh, such as boron which have energy levels slightly above the valence band edge. So, electrons from the valence band which are bound electrons uh, can move up to the acceptor sites charging them with negative charge leaving a free hole behind. So, this is the concept where we had ended the next, uh, the last lecture. So, now let us move on to the next slide. Here, we describe the energy band diagram again. So, we have a band gap which is characterized by the band gap energy uh, E g which is 1.12 electron volts at room temperature for silicon. We have free electrons in the conduction band and free holes in the valence band. Now, we have number of states in the conduction band that are distributed in the conduction band and these number of states are finite. So, these electrons in the conduction band can only occupy some of these states and obviously the tendency would be to seek the lowest energy position. So, electrons will initially populate the lower energy states and then they will move up to higher energy states. The, remember that in the energy band diagram, the electron in energy increases upwards and whole energy increases downwards. So, electron uh, at this position would have higher kinetic energy than the electron at the bottom of the conduction band edge. And similarly, holes uh, would tend to occupy the energy 
rotates very close to the valence band edge and as uh, they gain more and more energy, they will occupy these other states. There is a little typo here, this should be the whole kinetic energy. Now, let us talk about the concept of Fermi function. So, so this slide describes the concept of Fermi function. Uh, Fermi function describes the probability that a given state is occupied with electrons. So, the expression that uh, describes this Fermi function is given here. So, f small f is a probability that the state at energy E is occupied by an electron. So, this is a statistical uh, um, concept basically describing what is the probability of a state at energy E being occupied by an electron. And if you plot this function with uh, probability on the x axis and energy on the y axis you see uh, the shape uh, shown by the red line there. So, and then this green dotted line is this energy level E f also called the Fermi level. <coughs> so, if energy state we are considering is above the Fermi level, then in the expression E minus E f would be a positive number and the probability would reduce as shown by the red line. And if the energy is below the Fermi level, then the probability increases as shown by the red line. So, if you are very much below the Fermi level, then this state has a occupancy probability of 1. That means, it has a very high probability of being occupied. And on the other hand, if uh, the state is far above the Fermi level as shown here, then the, then the state has a very low probability of being occupied. And then, if the state is located at the Fermi level, it has a probability of 50 percent. So, this uh, Fermi function basically uh, is used to calculate how many electrons are in the conduction band, how many holes are in the valence band, because remember in the previous slide we said the states in the conduction band are distributed as a function of energy and same thing for holes, they are the number of states in the valence band are distributed as a function of energy. So, the product of the density of states times the Fermi function describes where each of these electrons are in the conduction band and valence band. And here schematically on the right hand side, we show that states can be considered to be occupied below the Fermi level on an average and states above the Fermi level can be assumed to be not occupied or empty. All right, so now we can apply this concept to the intrinsic material on the left hand side. So, here we have a conduction band, valence band and Fermi level is for the intrinsic material is in the middle of the band gap. And we have plotted the Fermi function with the red line showing that uh, probability of electron occupation of a state is very low above the Fermi level. But we know there are intrinsic number of electrons in the conduction band, intrinsic number of holes in the valence band if the material is intrinsic. And therefore, uh, 
we have small number of holes in the valence band, small number of electrons in the conduction band and Fermi level is exactly in the middle of the band gap. Now, the definition of band gap of course, are that there are no states in the band gap which can be occupied by an electron. So, that basically means that uh, uh, there will be no electrons in the band gap. So, the fact that Uh, the fact that uh, we have holes in the valence band basically indicates that uh, we have uh, absence of electrons in the valence band. All right. So, now we dope the material N type, Fermi level moves closer to the conduction band edge and therefore, we have lot more electrons in the conduction band, very few holes in the valence band. Holes is basically an absence of a electron. So, most of the states uh, in the valence band are occupied by electrons. Those are bound electrons, very few are missing and those that are missing are the holes. All right. Now, in the P type, Fermi level moves closer to the valence band edge and you can see that the probability of uh, electrons in the conduction band decreases quite a bit, but probability of electrons being in the valence band in the bound state increases quite a bit, uh, it decreases quite a bit. So, we have fewer bound electrons in the valence band which essentially means we have lot more holes in the valence band. So, this Fermi label concept is very useful in describing the if a state is occupied with an electron and holes and much later in the lectures, we will see that it is possible to have some states in the band gap of the material, if the band, if the material is not very pure and in those cases, we will use Fermi Dirac distribution to describe if the state is occupied by an electron or not. All right. So, now, let us consider the concept of freeze out and so, we know that if let us consider a material which is n type. So, we know that at room temperature n is equal to n d, which means that number of electrons are equal to the donor density. Now, as we start lowering the temperature, some of those donor atoms will not be able to uh, donate an electron to the conduction band because the temperature is low, they do not have enough energy to uh, jump from the donor state to the conduction band. So, in that case, the number of electrons reduces as we reduce the temperature and that is called the freeze out. Now, as we raise the temperature uh, on the left hand side, we see we have lot of intrinsic carriers, which is the result of electrons jumping from valence band to the conduction band. So, the n i value increases as a function of temperature at, as we had seen earlier. So, at some point, the electron and whole intrinsic carrier concentration will be equal to the donor uh, atom density N d and then the number of electrons and holes at higher temperature will exceed the donor atom density. So, at that point uh, material is set to become intrinsic when intrinsic carrier density is much, much higher than the background doping density and the same concept applies to p type material which is doped with 
acceptor atoms. So, the in very, very cold climates or at around liquid nitrogen temperatures, you can see that there is a freeze out happening and at very, very high temperatures 4 500 degrees C, you can see that uh, material can become intrinsic meaning lot of electrons and holes in the semiconductor much higher than the background doping. So, we are no longer able to control the electron and hole population by doping the material at very high temperatures. So, that is called the intrinsic rejoin. So, basically let us summarize that we have n type material where the electrons uh, population is described or electron concentration is described by n c times exponent of E c minus E f over k t with a negative sign. So, that essentially means that as we make the material more and more n type, Fermi level moves closer to the conduction band edge and my free electron carrier concentration in the conduction band increases. Similarly, P is described as N V which is the effective density of states in the valence band times the exponent of a negative of E f minus E v over k t. So, again if we make the p type material uh, more p type by doping it with more acceptor atoms, then the Fermi level moves closer to the valence band edge. In other words, E f minus E v decreases. An alternate expression for electron and holes in terms of intrinsic carrier concentrations are also given where the gap between the E f the Fermi level and the intrinsic level E i which is the middle of the band gap is measured uh, uh, with respect to the electron concentration. And again as electron concentration increases by doping it more heavily, the Fermi level moves away from the mid gap towards the conduction band edge. And similarly for P type, you can see that the Fermi level moves away from the mid gap towards the valence band edge as we increase the hole concentration. And the product of the two electron and hole concentrations is equal to n i squared, which is a constant given for a given material because n c is the effective density of states, uh, n v is the effective uh, density of states in the valence band, n c is the effective density of states in the conduction band which is different for different materials, but is a constant for a given material. These are effective density of states as if all the states were uh, <coughs> at the bottom of the conduction band edge or at the top of the valence band edge. And again the band gap is a constant for a material. The only variable here is temperature. So, if we increase the temperature, you can see N i increases very rapidly. All right. So, with this let us move into a, another uh, discussion and that is how electrons and holes give rise to the current in semiconductors. So, one of the carriers transport mechanism is drift. Drift is a process in which if we apply an electric field in the semiconductor the electrons and holes would move in opposite directions. Electrons being negative charge would move opposite to the electric field, whereas holes being positively charged will move in the direction of the electric field. So, drift basically describes the movement, average movements of electrons and holes in the presence of electric field. So, let us take a piece of semiconductor here, a cylindrical piece with the length delta x and a cross sectional area A. 
and you can see that the total current uh, is given by the charge swept by the cross sectional area A in per second. So, that means if the carriers were moving with an average drift velocity of V, then in time delta T all of these carriers will have swept through this cross sectional area A and will constitute the current. So, question is what is the drift velocity? That drift velocity is described at the bottom here. You can see that that drift velocity is proportional to the electric field. Obviously, if we apply higher electric field, the velocity of the electrons, again we are talking only about the average drift velocity will increase and therefore, the proportionality constant is called the electron mobility in this case and for holes it is called mu p which is the hole mobility. So, now the resistance of this material is simply the resistivity times the length divided by the area and resistivity is given by the number of electrons, number of holes and their respective mobilities by the given expression. So, we will return to this uh, concept of drift velocity in the next few slides, but it is important to understand that resistivity of the material is described by total number of electrons and holes in the material and the mobility of electrons and holes, which is basically the ability of electrons and holes to move on an average uh, under a given applied electric field. So, if you look at the material and if we could track an electron, we will see that the electrons are uh, on an average moving randomly uh, and then between when they collide with the host lattice atoms, in this case let us say silicon atoms which are periodically placed in a cubic lattice when the electrons in the conduction band which are free to move around in the crystal lattice uh, strike a or, or are scattered by a lattice uh, atom, then they completely come to a stop and then they start moving again. So, the motion between the of the electrons between the interstitial spaces of the silicon lattice is completely random. And from statistical consideration, we can say <coughs> that electrons have 3 degrees of motion in x, y, z and each degree of motion has an average kinetic energy of half k t. T being the temperature, K being the Boltzmann constant. So, for three dimensions x, y and z, the average kinetic energy is 3 halves K T. So, then one can calculate the kinetic energy of the electrons as they move between the collision events as uh, half m v square equals to 3 half K T and then you can calculate the thermal velocity which is 3 k t over m square root. Now, m is an effective mass of the electron, it is not the resting mass of the electron, which is roughly uh, the resting mass of electron is roughly 10 to the minus 30 k g or roughly 9 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. So, this mass is different because we have basically hidden lot of complexities from you of this randomness of electron movement in the material by assigning it an effective mass which is less than the resting mass of the electron. So, now we are simply using a classical mechanics. Once we assume there is an effective mass, 
and describe the movement of electrons by their average kinetic energy, which is 3 half k t equals to half m v square. Um, so, the classical concepts are not strictly applicable, but we simplify all this by basically assigning an effective value to the effective to the electron mass and that is called the effective uh, mass of the electron. So, similarly the holes are moving in again in the random direction very similar to this except the holes will have a different effective mass. All right. So, now let us say we apply an electric field shown by the vector E from left to right. So, what we are doing is we are superimposing. So, this electric field will exert a force on the hole and the force would be given by the charge of the hole times the electric field Q times E and again that force on the hole from left to right will have a tendency to impose a very small component of velocity to the right hand side and that is called the drift velocity and that is the drift velocity we had used in describing the mobility of these holes and electrons in the previous slides. So, that means that if we again apply the second law of uh, Newton again using classical mechanics in a very simple fashion, then the force equals to mass times the acceleration and the acceleration is the drift velocity divided by the, ev the mean time between collisions. So, the holes come to complete rest at a collision event and then they gain energy as they accelerate under the electric field and the time tau m p is called the mean free time between two collision events for the holes. <coughs> then you can see, you can do the math here. We are basically equating the effective mass of holes times the acceleration, which is V divided by tau m p equals to applied force, which is q e. And you come up with the drift velocity of this uh, hole or on an average would be proportional to q charge of the hole times the mean time between collisions times the electric field and inversely proportional to the effective mass of the holes. We can write this equation by simply V equals to mu p times electric field, mu p being a constant proportionality constant. So, now you can see from the last equation that if we increase the electric field, we can increase the drift velocity of the holes and therefore, the drift component of the hole will increase and therefore, the current will increase. So, mobility is a constant and that depends on number of factors for a material. Uh, but before we go there, you can see the same thing happens for electrons. The random motion is going on, but if we apply an electric field pointed to the right hand side, then there would be a net drift velocity to the left for electrons because the force on the electron would be minus q times e. And again, mobility will be described by the mean time of collisions there is a typo here, this should be q times tau of m n, n being the electrons divided by the effective mass of the electrons. Which, so, the mean time be, between uh, two collision events, this is called the mean free time and that is of the order of 0 0.1 picoseconds. All right. So, 
now we know that the carriers are moving randomly and by applying an electric field they can <coughs> there can be a net movement for electrons and holes depending upon the direction of the electric field and that gives rise to the charge and that drift velocity is proportional to the electric field and the proportionality constant is called the mobility for electrons and holes. Now, if we look at the carrier collisions, that means electrons and holes collisions at, as we had shown in the previous slide, there are two types of collisions. One is called the lattice scattering or a more fancy name is phonon scattering. This means the electrons are colliding with the silicon atoms, which are periodically placed in a cubic silicon lattice. And then the second type of uh, collision event is with Im ionized impurity. So, if you have doped it with N type, then you have lot of positive donors, which will have a coulombic attraction to the electron and that is called the ionized impurity scattering. Same thing for holes, if you have P type material, then you have negative charge on the acceptors, which has an attractive force for the holes and again that is called the ionized impurity scattering. It turns out that the uh, the collision or a scattering of electrons and holes is inversely proportional to the temperature. That means, if we increase the temperature, the probability of collision increases and the net mobility decreases. So, that is shown here and for the other type of scattering, which is the impurity scattering we described to you, we find that as we raise the temperature, the probability of scattering actually reduces and therefore, the mobility improves as a, we increase the temperature and the dependence is 3 halves to the power of T. And again, impurity scattering is inversely proportional to total number of impurity atoms. A material could contain both P type and N type materials and therefore, we use the sum of the N type and P type impurities N A plus N D. So, higher doped materials will have, will have lower mobility but the mobility will increase with temperature. So, as I was saying, the two types of scattering events take place for electrons and holes. The first type is called the phonon scattering, which is the scattering by lattice atoms. The second type is the ionized impurity scatter, scattering due to the positively charged donor atoms and negatively charged acceptor atoms. And the com each type of scattering even uh, describes the mobility for that particular type of scattering. And the combination rule is obviously uh, shown here, 1 over mu is 1 over mu of phonon plus 1 over mu of impurity. And the reason for this combination rule is the short, the lowest mobility determines the mobility of the combined mobility of the semiconductor, just like two resistors in parallel. So, in this chart, we are showing for silicon uh, carefully measured electron and hole mobilities as a function of doping. And in this case, we have considered both acceptor and donor atoms uh, if they are present at the same time in the semiconductor. So, you can see that in general, as we increase the doping from left to right, the mobility of electrons and mobility of holes reduces quite a bit. Uh, 
and that is due to the impurity scattering phenomena and you can see that for very, very low doped samples uh, the mobility is high because that is dominated by phonon scattering. So, in this case uh, electron mobility for very low doped material is roughly 1400 uh, centimeter square per volt second and holes have a lower mobility in general in many semiconductors uh, because holes have a higher effective mass and therefore, in silicon very low doped material the hole mobility is of the order of about 500 centimeter square per volt second. Uh, Let us work through this example calculation to show you how we use these mobility numbers to calculate the resistance of a rectangular piece of semiconductor. So, in this case we have a rectangular piece of semiconductor with a cross sectional area A and a doping of 10 to the 16 per centimeter cube n type. D stands for donor and the length of this slab is 100 micron and the width is 1 millimeter. So, then the question is can we calculate the resistance of this uh, semiconductor piece from if the current is flowing as shown by the arrows. So, and we are doing this at room temperature. So, we know that number of electrons is going to be equal to the number of dopants. So, that is 10 to the 16 per centimeter cube. Intrinsic carrier concentration we already know for silicon is about 1.5 times 10 to the 10 per centimeter cube at room temperature. So, we can calculate the whole carrier density from this expression because we know that n times p is always equals to n i squared and you see that the whole carrier density is very, very small compared to the electron carrier density. Now, for <coughs> from the expression for electron carrier density in terms of intrinsic carrier density, we know electron carrier density, we know n i. So, we can calculate E f minus E i using a k t which is uh, 26 milli electron volts uh, at room temperature. We can calculate 0 0.35 electron volt uh, energy for the difference between E f and E i. So, we can calculate the position of the Fermi level if we know the carrier concentration as in this case. Now, to calculate the resistance, we know that the resistivity is due to the drift phenomena is 1 over q mu n n plus q mu p times p and we can look up electron mobilities and hole mobilities from this chart I have shown you and we can see that electron mobility is about 1250 centimeter square per volt second for a doping of 10 to the 16 per centimeter cube. This term we can neglect because the number of holes are at least uh, 12 orders of magnitude is smaller than the electrons and then L is 100 microns, cross sectional area is 1 millimeter by 1 micron. Watching our units, uh, the charge of the electron is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 12 coulombs. Mobility for electrons is 1250 centimeter square per volt second, number of electrons is 10 to the 16 per centimeter cube, length is 100 times 10 to the minus 4 centimeters. So, 1 micron is equal to 10 to the minus 4 centimeters. 
and the cross sectional area is uh, uh, 1 millimeter which is 0.1 centimeters times 1 micron which is 10 to the minus 4 centimeters. You calculate all this you get 500 ohms. So, the resistance of this uh, semiconductor slab a rectangular slab is 500 ohms uh, if the current flowing from left to right or right to left, right. So, if we apply a voltage V, we know the resistance, we can calculate the current. Then there is a concept of specific on resistance and that is called RSP, SP is the specific uh, on resistance and that is the product of the resistance times the cross sectional area of that material. So, we apply multiply 500 ohms with the cross sectional area of that material, we get 5 milli ohm centimeter square. So, what this means and this is very often used for power devices and we will use this later on. So, it is good to describe the concept here. What this means is if we could have a semiconductor with 1 centimeter square cross section, then the resistance of that slab would be 5 milli ohms. If we reduce the area, then the resistance goes up. If we increase the area, then the resistance goes down. But this basically means if we have 1 centimeter square cross sectional area, then the resistance is 5 milli ohms. So, that is the definition of specific on resistance. It is basically the resistance times the cross sectional area. And this gives us a basis now for comparing different materials. If they have different mobilities for electrons and holes, then we could say this has a higher specific on resistance than the other material. All right. So, we should look at the temperature dependence of electron mobility in silicon. As we said, two types of scattering, phonon scattering also called lattice scattering and that scattering remember uh, increases as a function of temperature, 3 half power to the temperature. So, the mobility reduces as a function of temperature. We have given you these plots for electron mobility for silicon as a function of different doping densities. So, you can see as we increase the doping density, the impurity scattering increases and the mobility reduces, but you can see that for higher doped material, you can see that impurity scattering limited mobility goes up with temperature and then we have phonon scattering at higher temperature that reduces the mobility. So, these plots have been measured for given materials with different doping and it is important to remember that this doping is the total doping, total number of donors plus total number of acceptors in the material. All right. So, here is a chart comparing uh, electron mobilities for different materials. In this case, we have a silicon carbide we call 4-H silicon carbide and that is a particular type of silicon carbide which we will describe later and then we have a material called gallium nitride which we will describe later to you, but collectively if you remember we had described silicon carbide and gallium nitride as wide band gap materials and then we have silicon here. So, you can see the electron mobility as a function of doping concentration for silicon, silicon carbide and gallium nitride. You can see silicon has the highest electron mobility up to this point and then silicon carbide uh, is slightly better than silicon and gallium nitride is lot better than silicon at higher doping concentrations. Similarly, we show you whole mobilities uh, for silicon, gallium nitride and silicon carbide and again you see that the whole mobilities in uh, silicon carbide are much lower than silicon. Uh, 
but again as we increase the total number of uh, acceptor carrier acceptor uh, concentration or doping concentration the whole mobility decreases further so here we show you the temperature dependence of electron mobility and hole mobility from 300 k to 500 k and uh, you can see that as we increase the temperature the phonon or lattice scattering dominates and the mobility reduces pretty much in a very similar fashion remember t to the power minus 3 halves uh, so let me stop here for this lecture and uh, uh, would like to thank you for uh, attending this lecture.